Okay, here's another article that I could work well off of with what we've been talking about recently and make some more connections. Um, this picture seen here, while it might look like a bad attempt at a Bob Ross photograph with some people thrown in it, is kind of a depiction of early life in the Ice Age even before the last glacial maximum that was going on where the ice pulled as much water as possible up into it before it started to release and then all of a sudden boom the younger driest event and the big release goes on when you look at this picture you would think uh, where are we looking at well it's early Europe probably some 35,000 BC but this same type of thing could have gone on much later. When we look at this, in the distance in the background, they've put in a lot of animals. And in the bottom right-hand corner there, peekabooing over the bushes, is a giant stag that has a huge rack on it, even bigger than an elk type of thing. And there used to be this stag that's known from across Europe that used to be there that no longer is there right in this range here there look appears to be what's a bear or something that's being attacked by two of three lions that are there they don't have any manes on them or anything but they're definitely lions and a lot of people don't even realize that there used to be primordial lions all across Europe and even into the Americas in fact quite a few of these creatures could go in both locations right and e even things like bison type animals that are there in the very low distance here horse type animals where they got killed off at the end of the last ice age and didn't show back up until the Spaniards came and a lot of people um, well there are a few that believe that there was a patch that got connected still because there are variations of these mustangs and wild horses that have a thicker coat on them almost a woolly version of that situation but they live way up in the mountains of Colorado and all this type of thing and they attribute it to that but other people go no no and so but you, you, you can't fight with these type of people and there's almost no way of doing so unless you can genetically prove it in things nowadays right it's gotten to, gotten to that point also up over here in this back right hand corner here there's a couple of mammoths well they really look like elephants that are painted brown but then again if they drew them real shaggy it would just look like a blob in fact it would be a blob a lot like snuffleupagus if y'all ever watched sesame street i remember being in second grade and the teacher was trying to get the people to say elephant, but she brought up what Snephalophagus looked like. And I raised my hand. She's like, okay. And I said, uh, he's a woolly mammoth. And she was like, uh, oh, got me. And she was really looking for elephant. And she described how they were closely related and that we used to have woolly animals and everything. And some of the kids in the, you know, this is right at the age people were getting into dinosaurs and things like that. But having an older brother and a few things I had already gotten into it because he got into it earlier and I got to see that you know so being a younger brother has its attributes in a lot of situations like that where you get to see somebody just a few years older than you go through some crap and when you reach that point you're like oh okay anyhow so where is this again well uh, I'm telling you that uh, this is Europe and it's actually a lot further south than you would think it would be because during the last ice age situations like this anywhere there was a mountain there were situations like this going but know that right over your right shoulder here down in that valley it worked out just fine but it had its winters and in fact if you go down farther in the valleys then there were once places that were havens and stuff you know like Samaria would have been at the time and uh recently talked once about in my videos how these places were lush and had a forest in an ancient time and they don't anymore well they used to get so much more rain six to twelve times the amount of rain they get now well now they get next to nothing well twelve times next to nothing is something 
12 inches of rain is a whole lot more than one or 0.7 you know and it makes a big difference into what goes on but uh, of course the people of that area it take, took out the forests and it wasn't able to regrow real fast because of the ecology and the way it had changed and everybody's all global warming freak out but let me tell you that happened without human intervention other than that fact and it's not too undifferent than like what happens in the rainforest but happened naturally and primordially but supposedly back at this time right here they didn't have any cows yet or anything like that and that they were just hunter gatherers well we're fixing to get into that and I hope it's not a two-parter and I can get it all into one but I'm afraid that it's going to be because we're gonna look at something on Robert Seffer's side here later it may be part two though keep in check with that it, it's here but notice that there were sites like this though that would have been what it looked like at winter and going away from winter and after winter was all over with the only snow you would really see is just on the cap of that mountain up there and then the winter would come again and so on and these conifer trees and evergreens and stuff that would be able to live in that area thrived like cedars and you find cedars are well seeded all the way into Lebanon and the ancient places that were there and all through the Fertile Crescent too so it got pushed down and was healthy enough into that and then it receded back is basically what happened kind of like the middle of America and it's turned into Dust Bowl Oklahoma and everything but they did that because of pulling out a lot of the animals or not animals but plants flora instead of fauna but let's just go ahead and get into this and I've got a few other topics but you can remember this little scene that was here I've got another thing that I could say easily about it but we can flash back to this scene Stone Age people were eating porridge 32,000 years ago yep this is one that probably fits under the category from, what is it, three years ago where I was doing a series called Much Older Than Previously Thought, but of course I've added so many videos to that in just the last two, two and a half years because things keep showing up, like when we looked at the Iron Age and so on, and actually really astronomy and mathematics and all these type of things that in a modern day you know thought they came from this time and Pythagoras and so on and it's like no it's based on all this stuff that they figured out was going on a long time ago and apparently it's not brand new to them because even Gobekli Tepe's got this stuff going on so it just takes a huge step with that archaeologists say they have found traces of wild oats on grinding tools from about 32,000 years ago about 22 about 20,000 years before formal farming is thought to have been established. The prehistoric people may have baked or boiled the oats and made flat bread, according to researchers. The research, uh, which has been underway for a number of years, seems to conflict with the belief that Stone Age people were largely carnivorous. They found these flat stones, and some of them are associated with this, some are associated with red ochre, and other ones they know that they did the grain thing on because it's got this wallowed out area where exactly the same thing was going on. Recently I showed a video and it shows this woman that she would, for all intents and purposes, think she was an Indian type lady. And then you look at her and you go, no, and she's got green eyes. Wow, what are they trying to talk about? Well, primordial people and somebody that wasn't blonde but did have that blue or you know green eyed gene type going on but I talked about that and said I wish I'd have that well I wish I had that for this to be able to show it to you if you can flash back to that one anyhow they thought that people might collect stuff as they're going around and basically the concept I was led to believe is that women might occasionally go out on their own or with younglings but not kids but with younglings you know uh, teenagers and things like that and you would think well those would be going with the men learning it well the men didn't want 35 people going and making a bunch of noise so they had to do it a certain way it's just like going out hunting ducks and everything well, let's take everybody in the four-wheelers and everything and it's like you never see a duck if you go pulling it that way 
Anyhow, they thought that people would go around and they might gather as they were walking through the forest. Like, oh, there's some berries. And somebody would say, yeah, those are okay to eat. And they'd grab a bunch of them and maybe have enough to give some to the people back and da-da-da. But they're all really based on meat. But that's not necessarily the way it's so. In fact, this paleo diet that everybody's talked so much about might change its little ideal of where it goes unless you want to go with a much elder time. Researchers have assumed that the primary foods Paleolithic or Stone Age people relied on were meats and fats. They say botanical traces on food preparation tools and stone vessels are rare at Stone Age archaeological sites. However, in the past several years of analysis, stone tools have revealed the presence of traces of wild grains and seeds and roots of cattails and ferns so that they were using it and so that basically salads and things like that one other who was talking about it must be dandelions and this type of stuff you know so greens and everything and you know well they were you know they they knew what was edible uh we we surely knew what was edible before we were even humans some people don't want to make these leaps it's weird but uh, and, and it's odd that they, uh, about other people that are still somewhat primitive, they go, oh, they could have boats and they were doing all this other stuff, but then other people that weren't, they can't give credit for it to. But we'll get into that later. A recent fad diet, the paleo diet, may need to be reconsidered in light of new research. The researchers in this latest study led by Marta and Marotti Lippi of Italy's University of Florence say the finding is the earliest known preparation of oats for human consumption. She and her team examined a stone grinding tool from Grotta Paglisi in southern Italy and found traces of oats and evidence of grinding from 32,000 years ago. And Paglisi Cave is kind of famous now for a few different reasons other than being a great saved sanctuary cave that was for Cro-Magnons in ancient time and in fact another key point is that the Cro-Magnon that they found there they genetically sequenced and find that it's actually a haplogroup and genetic sequence that's still active today not some radical different thing but we'll get into that later for if we don't talk about that there's going to be this big open spot The news follows research that Marietta Lippi participated in several years ago that found traces of wild starch on grinding tools in Italy, Russia, and the Czech Republic from at least 30,000 years ago. So widespread across. And there's another one in France, by the way. That finding was announced in a 2010 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And this is just one of these types of stones. And see, sometimes they're a grinding stone that's been hollowed out. Then again, it looks like this might have been the one with the arch on it that you pushed against the grain and, and did it also too. But they took other stones that were like this, that were fairly smooth, and you would set them in the fire and get them warm, and you would make a little patty, and you'd slap it onto there, and you'd basically make something that's like a tortilla. Or, you know, a, oh, what's the word for it? Anyhow baguette no no that's not it um so that's one of the grinding stones here from paglisi and it has evidence of oats on it we had evidence of the processing of roots and cattails but here we've got a grain and a grain that we're very familiar with said mr pope or matt pope an archaeologist on the team told new scientist if we're to look more systematically for ground stone technology, we would find this a more widespread phenomenon. And there's been quite a few of these that they've found. I've showed a couple of in videos in these last, man, well, hell, it goes back more than two years now. Uh, but in my mind, I can distinctly remember a few different times we've looked at it and go, da, 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 and you know, here's a grinding stone. So we're talking about making bread, and, and whenever they tried to say something was long ago, long before bread was even made, are they taking this into account? Because, damn. 
you know, so you have, have that idea. The study Pope refers to says, however, that evidence of wild grain consumption also goes back to the Upper Paleolithic at a site in the Levant. So there also. The researchers in that 2010 article say they found evidence of processing of grains and seeds in the Sea of Galilee area, site of Ohalo. It was also in this part of the world, known as the Fertile Crescent, that agriculture first believed to have been practiced starting around 12,000 years ago. But I don't know how long y'all have been into this at all. But whenever I was a kid, it was like kind of 2,500, and they go, well, here's the stuff to do it with, older than that. And they go, oh, I don't, uh, okay, well, 3,000, and they go, here's some little art thing, and they're doing it here, and there's the cattle and everything, and oh, so it's 5,200, and 55, 58, 64, then we find Gobekli Tepe, and they go, okay, well, it, it, it was, it's not here, it's not here, but it was right after now, and you go, really, if you look around there, that'd be pretty cool back in the day to just throw out some grain and get it going and feed all the people in there, and it would cover their grain technology, and then it'd only take some hunters that are pretty damn good going out in all directions to help feed the group of people that were there, maybe because of a culture and the group that was going on that was easy to pull off but they don't want to say that people could even have gotten together back then but then you look at Gobekli Tepe and you have to realize there was a whole lot of getting together then and that does not look like a new phenomenon if you're unfamiliar it's circles like Stonehenge but they've got carvings on them they're T-pillars and smaller 18 foot taller the big ones but looking pillars that are like Stonehenge and all set up the same way and they've got different zodiacal patterns and pictures carved into them and boss relief animals yeah and and uh, it seems to go with stellar events and there's sacred geometry going on so instantly we push back any thoughts that people were saying yeah they had it in, in ancient Sumeria and it's okay well you're going with 3500 there right and they go yeah and they go okay Here's about 10 to 12,000 years ago. They want you to think there's a big gap there, but that gap gets filled up by that concept and other things. We're, we're talking about them. If you've been watching my recent videos, I've gone back and forth through this timeline here recently after we talked about ancient stuff and biblical things just to get people in the mood and then talk, start talking about where all that came from and hey what's up with those proto-indo-europeans anyhow european paleolithic populations are generally considered to have been predominantly carnivorous because the evidence for plant substance is limited currently evidence for the paleolithic human diet is obtained from bone chemistry, dental microware, and zoological archaeological remains for a variety of reasons. The last form of evidence is a rare is rare at Paleolithic sites and Paleolithic populations are primarily considered as hunters rather than even so much hunter gatherers. That's what she wrote in 2010, but her paper was that none, not so much, huh? Previous studies at Dolny Volstis, I'm going to tear that up, might as well not say it. Gilosora, Kabara, and Ohalo identified plant remains. So these are the other four sites she was talking about Dolny, Vestanis, Gilosora, Kibara, and Ohalo. But then there's the one in France, which I don't think that's the one that's mentioned. And then is the one that's in the Holy Land mentioned there. Plausibly representing the important element of the diet and the last mentioned site also documents a routine processing of wild cereals and effective methods for cooking ground seeds. A number of Upper Paleolithic sites also yielded grindstones, some of which may have served for grinding plant tissue whereas others were often for grinding and used for red ochre. And we've talked about red ochre and its symbology and how old it goes back with these same type of people. 
So we keep talking about these same type of people. And we're going to find out later. They're still among us. Stay tuned. Here we report on starch grains recovered on grinding stones from three mid-upper Paleolithic or Gravetan and Gurustovan sites across Europe. And so Gravetan cultures comes in about midway on it, but they say their analysis of starches and wear on tools from the site shows that pounding and grinding of wild plants was done relatively early in the upper Paleolithic time. And they talk about roots and doing things like that. So there easily could have been things going on like guacamole making. Not that it would have been with guacamole, but other roots and other things like that. Right? So a whole lot of other situations going on with it. But then finding oats even sets it for another notch. Because now we have a cultivated grain, which becomes a staple food. Really, really up until a modern time, it was quite more of a staple food for a lot of people. <clears throat> Eric Trinkhouse of Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, United States, calls the findings another example of how advanced the people of Europe's Gravetan culture were. They produced technology, art, and elaborate burials. Here's one of the sites and the paintings that's on it. Where is that? That's the Altamira Cave. But there are sites where they could show it here, and, and instead of it just looking like a bowl and this going on, that that's actually Taurus. In fact, they have little dots that are like the stars, and then they fill it out. In fact, over his shoulders, there's some dots. And there's the Pleiades, and there's this, and three dots over here, so that's got to be Orion, and a string of dots. What does that do? Well, there's like 28 of them. And that goes with the moon. And then there's this other set that doesn't make any sense until you can see where the sun comes in off this one thing and makes a mark. And through the year, it changes a little bit. And that they had marked that and delineated it. So they kind of knew when winter was coming, summer, things like that. But it goes a lot deeper than that. How, how soon does archaeoastronomy type thing go where they knew when the seasons were going to come well they've been paying attention for a lot older than this i think it goes back in cultures before what we even call cro-magnon but it just comes strong then they ended up putting two and two together and so on kind of like uh, when you look at uh, the uh, old show clan of the cave bear how she could count and do things and stuff, and the other guy figured it out that she, oh, wow, and then he, she's like, hold up on that. Those, they can't count plus five, and was trying to make fun of Neanderthals and the people that he was from, if you've seen it. So these people were described 15 years ago as hunters of the Golden Age, and the details that were still being filled out, Trinko told new scientist, well, I tell you, whenever I was a kid, they were called Ugg, but Ugg a little smarter than Neanderthal. And now we find that their times overlapped and all this happened and there's some Neanderthal intergression. We may talk more about that in just a little bit. but So we've learned a whole lot more about it and changed a whole lot, but then there's still some concepts and thoughts that are hung way back. If you look way back, there's some people that have had pretty much the modern theory now that we're figuring out figured out a long time ago but no 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 and they went out in left field also you can't look at this in a correct light anymore because it's all racist if it doesn't somehow involve everybody we'll get into that later too Marotta Lippi and her team hope to analyze more stone tools for evidence and traces of grain or root grinding. Trinkow said that the evidence may predate 32,000 years ago. Well, I think that it does. There's one that's like 46,000 years ago, and they don't want to credit it to Cro-Magnon because Cro-Magnon's earliest date is like 48,000, really about 50, because they have a float of like 3,500 years on either side of 48. So you might as well just say, oh, 50,000. 
Well, oh, it's a 48. Okay, well, it's worth 2,000 A.D., so that's 48, which is 50,000 years ago. Give or take. I'm not trying to push a date too damn much, if at all. Roughly 48,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. There's some evidence that they don't want to give credit for, and they don't want to really give credit for Cro-Magnon, even though Cro-Magnon is since then been found past that date because they didn't just didn't have enough skull material and so on to really validate it. but the piece that they had they were pretty much like well if you tried to stick that in that would go this one that's the one that's like well these cranial guys are really way into it but then again there's a whole modern edict too that we all have to fight against in 2010, Lauren Cordain published the book Paleo Diet that advised readers to eat like prehistoric cave dwellers to lose pounds and to stay healthy because, hell, they all had good teeth and didn't really seem like they had a bunch of people that were obese. Well, they didn't waste food, and if you ever had to run from something or something like that, it didn't work out too good for the fat person. And while the elderly were kept for in a group, so it would be able to have some type of protection to it. The hunting type people and the people that were going and doing, they had to have that fitness going on and uh, so it worked out pretty good. You know, did they have any workout things? No, life was a workout. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, he advised eating lean meat, fish, nuts, seeds, eggs, vegetables and cutting out wheat, dairy, sugar, potatoes, and processed food. Some researchers equate this, the rise of agriculture to the introduction of grains into the diet with corresponding higher rates of disease in the human fossil record. This study shows that even many thousands of years ago, people were deviating from the paleo diet to eat grains and roots. And so whenever they thought that this disease that they could detect maybe because of the way the bones used to connect and things like this and it looks like they had this going on it may be that those people were lacking real hard to diet basically going through something like scurvy or other things and causing this effect with them because they were eating too much fish and not enough of this not enough of that and it could have been ecological it could have been a whole lot of things that made it happen but people figured it out real quick. You know, it doesn't take these guys, they're pretty smart. You can imagine if this girl kept eating nuts and all this stuff and nobody else was doing it, and then everybody got sick except for this girl, they'd be like, what the hell's going on? She starts eating nuts in front of them again, and they go, give me some of that shit. Well, what is it? well it's high in vitamin E and da-da-da, and everybody starts feeling better, and they're like, maybe we ought to do that. Maybe we ought to do this. Maybe we ought to mix in things. And Grandma, next thing you know, throws a few things together, and people are like, damn, this is good. You know, I thought cheese was good, and I thought meat was good, but when you put meat and cheese, that's damn good. Hey, that bread thing, give me one of those, and I'm going to throw a piece of that on here with a, oh, man, that's great. Well, how old, how old does cheese go back? Well, it's amazing. It goes back quite a bit. Where are we at? 28, coming up on 30. Looks like we'll be able to get a whole lot in, hopefully all the way to the end here. See if we can get it. So, this is Atlantean Guardians, uh, Gardens <laughs> website, Atlantean Guardians, yeah, that, that fits with it too, doesn't it? And uh, it's Robert Seffer's site, he's the one that writes these books, Gods with Amnesia, Species with Amnesia, which I've got The Secret of Vril, 1666 Redemption, which is very revealing in a more modern time than I usually talk about because it gets too personal, but... Let's talk about this Cro-Magnon. See, because Cro-Magnon's DNA is basically unchanged for 28,000 years. And you know, whenever they figured this out, they gave it the low date. And it has, again, like a 3,500 push on either side. You basically can say 30,000 years ago, especially since we're in 2000 A.D. So, and scientists have figured this out because from Paglisi Cave, they got the genetics of one of the Cro-Magnons that were there and whenever they show you this thing that looks like clan of the cave bear it's for a reason and what I'm telling you whenever I was studying this at first I got this idea yeah it's more like that and people were really heretical towards that 
and thought that Neanderthal maybe looked if they didn't give them enough makeup and should have made them halfway between that and Planet of the Apes and this, that, and the other stuff. And they're like, man, we put quite a bit of makeup on those people and made them look a lot more primitive looking. But, duh, well, now in a modern day, they'd be like, yeah, you don't have to make them walking around like that. But, yeah, you know, you, you really had it more figured out. In fact, even having somebody like Daryl Hannah in that situation of a Cro-Magnon seems to fit. For here's Robert's video, and it shows her herself getting some water and realizing what she looked like in the water compared to what they looked like and why they all freaked out and thought there was something wrong with her. There wasn't nothing wrong with her at all. There's a lot, a lot of right with her. But... Let's continue. If Neanderthal is supposed to have lived in Europe beginning 300,000 years ago, and Cro-Magnon for the last 30,000, well, really it's about 50. It depends on if you try to put it at a Ignatian period or not at 33,000. But then they found, well, they said that. Well, they, they found them older, so what are you going to do? Still, it's just no lab, but Homo sapiens sapiens has been found 315,000 years, just a year, year and a half ago, Jebel Arud Cave. So that, that throws a whole wrench in the situation because it used to be they thought they could go, it goes A, B, C, D, and it's like, doesn't work out that way. No, it doesn't work. And the whole out of Africa theory is thrown out and everything. We'll talk about that maybe in a little bit, but here we go. So they thought it happened 30,000, 33,000. Well, really, it goes back to 48, you know, as we talked about years ago or so. And it turns out that their modern DNA is basically unchanged since that time. So when did we do all this evolving? You know, they modernly have a thought that we were all similar and the exact same thing. But just moving out here, moving out here, we got a lot of difference going on. Well, I find in my research of looking at it, and, and I, I'm no super dude on the bone thing, okay? But listening to some of these guys and then putting it all together, kind of, and you're like, okay, you try to say this, but if I could almost shut you up and just watch it, 